Following Iran's massive drone and missile attack on Israel early Sunday, the United States has announced a significant escalation in its punitive measures against Tehran. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan announced plans to impose new sanctions on Iran, declaring that punitive measures targeting Iran's missile and drone program, as well as the Revolutionary Guards and the Iranian Defense Ministry, will be implemented in the coming days. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan revealed that the U.S. will soon impose new sanctions targeting Iran's missile and drone program, as well as entities such as the Revolutionary Guards and the Iranian Defense Ministry. These measures are intended to contain and degrade Iran's military capacity and confront its problematic behaviors. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby said the U.S. is aiming for international isolation and increased pressure on Iran. Much of the world today is standing with Israel. When the president spoke to the G7 leaders yesterday, they were unified in their condemnation of Iran and their determination to hold Iran accountable at the president's direction. Our teams are now following up with G7 capitals on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile and other nefarious programs. G7 countries that had yet to designate the IRGC a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. And going forward, we will be working to further isolate Iran internationally and increase economic and other forms of pressure. So that's the upshot here. A stronger Israel, a weaker Iran, a more unified alliance of partners. This announcement comes amid growing international concern over Iran's aggressive actions and Israel's potential response, with Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen and European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell signaling their support for imposing sanctions as well. The U.S. anticipates its allies and partners to follow its lead with parallel measures. Meanwhile, as tensions escalate between Israel and Iran, the IDF have reportedly made a decision on how to counter-strike Iran and its proxies, but the timing remains at their discretion. And now we go to ILTV's Rachel Safdi, who's out in Tel Aviv by the Israeli military headquarters. Rachel, has a decision been made regarding a potential Israeli response to Iran's assault early on Sunday? Hi, Sivan. Well, the short answer is yes. Israel will be retaliating. There will be a counterattack on the Islamic Republic of Iran after, you know, such a large-scale attack on Israel coming directly from their soil. We've heard from multiple political and military leaders. Uh, we've heard from IDF uh, spokesperson Daniel Agari that an attack at, at that scale will not go by unresponded. Some reports actually do say that Israel already knows what they're going to do, how they're going to respond, and it's a matter of time. However, it is very important to note that U.S. President Joe Biden actually said after the Iranian offensive against Israel that they would not be supporting Israel in a potential counterattack. And while we've seen after the Iranian attack that there was a defense coalition in the area that was built, we saw the U.S., the U.K., France, Jordan, even Saudi Arabia to a certain extent that actually helped Israel, aided Israel in defending themselves. And Israel will be needing the support of their allies in this potential counterattack. Now, what do we know about the timing of a potential counterattack, and what could this look like? Right. Well, there's actually been a lot of speculation and different reports regarding what this retaliation, what this counteroffensive is going to look like. Some reports say that Israel might target Iran's nuclear facilities, even IRGC generals or the, the facilities that produced and launched the missiles and drones that targeted Israel or even a cyber attack. Uh, we actually got a hint from IDF chief of staff Herzia Levy uh, regarding the timing of, of this counteroffensive. He actually mentioned that he wants to give some peace of mind and a, a break of, of so much conflict for the Israeli people, uh, indicating that this could happen after Pesach, or this could actually be a tactic, you know, getting Iran to lower their guard and then having a surprise attack in the next few days. And he also mentioned uh, a few sentences regarding the power of the Israeli Air Force, indicating that this could be uh, an Israeli operation of, of Israeli planes, you know, going all the way to Tehran. Thank you for that update, Rachel. Amidst escalating tensions following the Islamic Republic's recent missile attack on Israel, the U.S. House of Representatives approved a dozen pro-Israel and anti-Iran bills. ILTV's Rachel Safdie has more on this as well. The U.S. House of Representatives took swift action after the Islamic Republic's attack on Israel, approving a dozen pro-Israel and anti-Iran bills. These measures, aimed at bolstering support for Israel, received widespread backing 
but encountered opposition, primarily from members of the squad and other progressives. Critics cautioned that the legislation might have unintended consequences that could unnecessarily scrutinize U.S. businesses dealing with the Export-Import Bank. Representative AOC, a Democrat who historically stands against supporting aid for Israel, expressed deep concern, asserting that the bills were designed purposely to increase the likelihood of a deadly regional war or worse. In a significant move, the House also passed a resolution by a decisive vote of 377 against 44, declaring the face, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, as anti-Semitic. Furthermore, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson announced a supplemental foreign aid package for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan will be voted on separately. However, uncertainty looms over whether the Democratic-controlled Senate will take up the legislation passed by the House, potentially leading to delays without unanimous consent. They deny the kidnapping of our children, the murder of our grandchildren, the rape of our daughters. The new Nazis we face today will stop at nothing to destroy civilization as we know it. The World Jewish Congress was created exactly for these times like this. So every Jew can fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. And joining us now is former Consul General of Israel in Los Angeles, Yaki Dayan. Thank you for joining. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, the U.S. aims to sanction Iran and President Joe Biden has called on other G7 nations to follow his lead. What could this look like, do you think? So to start with, uh, I wouldn't count on the Security Council. Um, as you very well know, the uh, Iranians have strategic cooperation with the Russians and the Chinese are not going to support any major actions against or any sanctions against the Iranians. So the Security Council is not really an option. Uh, but definitely uh, the United States and other countries are an option. And, and uh, what uh, we have to see now is a strong diplomatic uh, concerted effort to uh, sanction Iran. One of the good things that uh, that came out of this horrible attack by the Iranians is that they, they are back to the international focus. Um, the world was not really interested in the Iranians and they are now back and big time. Uh, and what we have to see is uh, some kind of a joint diplomatic effort, maybe by the G7 that is uh, convened today uh, and many other countries, European countries, and definitely the United States, sanctions on three major uh, sectors, I would say. One is the oil sector, the other one is the financial sector, and no doubt that the third one is the military and especially the nuclear sector. And if we see a, a very uh, concerted and, and uh, uh, diplomatic effort by, by those countries, uh, then it's going to put uh, one more pressure on the uh, Iranian regime. Now, assuming that sanctions will be enforced, in your opinion, is this enough of a response to the massive Iranian assault on Israel, launching 350 drones and missiles, including over 100 ballistic missiles, into Israel from Iranian soil? No, that's clearly not, not enough, but that would be a, a good start to see the uh, uh, Europeans and especially the Americans uh, are putting the uh, Iranians back in the international focus, that, that, that's a good start. Uh, listen, we have a few achievements coming out from, uh, from the Iranian attack. First, I mean, the, the, the technological superiority that Israel had is, is striking. And, and I would say that's the first achievement. But the second achievement is this uh, coalition that was created not because of the attack way before, but functioned so well in this attack and and we see in this uh, coalition uh, members from the moderate arab countries and uh, european countries and headed by the united states so a step in the right direction you say yaki mm -hmm. thank you very much my pleasure experience the power of truth with iltv news if you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals join our news community and become an integral part of our team 
as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. In Israel's north, continuous Hezbollah rocket fire has targeted northern communities with sirens sounding throughout the day with a direct hit to a community center building in the western Galilee, injuring at least 14 men, some in critical condition. In Gaza, one soldier was severely wounded in the northern Gaza Strip. All of these military updates are in the following report. In the latest rocket barrage fired by Hezbollah into northern Israel today, one rocket made a direct hit in the western Galil, hitting a community center building and injuring at least 14 men, with three initially reported in critical condition. In a separate incident, Mata added that a man was critically injured when his car was hit by a Hezbollah drone. This story is developing as sirens are going off continuously. Additionally, in yesterday's reported IDF strike in southern Lebanon, the target was identified as Ismail Yousaf Baz, the commander of Hezbollah's coastal sector. Another top Hezbollah commander was eliminated, this time in the area of Kfaldunin. When an IDF aircraft struck and eliminated the terrorist Muhammad Hussein Mustafa Seshori, Muhammad was the commander of the rocket and missiles unit of Hezbollah's Radwan forces in Lebanon's central and western region. These targeted strikes come just after the terror group launched drones into Israeli territory, injuring three people when they exploded near Bet Hillel yesterday. So far, the skirmishes on the northern border have resulted in at least eight civilian deaths on the Israeli side, as well as the death of 10 IDF soldiers and reservists while Hezbollah has named 278 members who have been killed by Israel in these clashes. In Gaza, a combat soldier from the Shaldag Special Forces Unit was severely wounded in the northern Gaza Strip in a pinpoint operation conducted in Beit Hanun. The soldier was evacuated to the nearest hospital for further treatment. The 162nd Division is continuing to operate in the central Gaza Strip. At the request of the division, the IDF Air Force eliminated a number of terrorists and destroyed terrorist infrastructure. One of the strikes was on a terrorist cell operating an armed drone toward IDF troops in the area. An IDF aircraft struck the terrorists. IAF aircraft also struck a number of rocket launchers that were ready to be launched toward Israeli territory. Palestinian health officials said an Israeli strike killed four people and wounded several others in Rafah, where over half of Gaza's 2.3 million people are sheltering, and bracing for a planned Israeli ground offensive into the city, which borders Egypt. Humanitarian aid is still entering the Gaza Strip consistently. On Wednesday, Kojat released a video depicting over 700 aid trucks sitting at the Karam Shalom crossing, waiting for UN agency pickup. Kojat also confirmed that as of Tuesday evening, 376 humanitarian aid trucks were inspected and transferred to Gaza, out of which 105 trucks were transferred via the Jordanian route. Despite recent criticism, Kojat has been efficiently posting on X photo documentation of aid entering the Gaza Strip and Gazan markets full of necessary food items. It's been 193 days since Hamas terrorists crossed the border and entered Israeli kibbutzim, brutally massacring, raping, and kidnapping peaceful citizens. Almost 200 days since the attack, and the hostages are still in Hamas captivity, undergoing unforeseeable torture. Now hostage family members are urging diplomats to apply pressure in the hopes of seeing their loved ones released in a hostage for a ceasefire deal. ILTV's Ariel Lachiani has more. On Tuesday, April 16th, relatives of hostages still held in Gaza made a plea to international diplomats urging them to apply pressure on the Israeli government to facilitate the release of their loved ones. Does any of you know what's the end game of this war? When your government support us, what are they asking in return? How will you face the severe criticism over this war back home when you don't have a proper answer as to where it's going? I ask of you what, I've demand, what I demand of my own government, responsibility. We need you to use all your power to put pressure both in Israel and to give you answers. Where is this going? The plea for intervention from foreign diplomats came at a Passover Seder dinner held in Tel Aviv, 
but the anguish of the hostage's relatives was palpable. Their desperation highlights the ongoing suffering of civilians in the conflict, emphasizing the crucial need for diplomatic action to end the deadlock and ensure the safe return of the hostages. We are now on day 193, and our worry for our people is um, crushing. Um, we face all these marks of the year, the Jewish year, our holidays, our birthdays, our hostage birthdays, the birth of children, and all this we face knowing that our loved ones are in there. The situation has reached a critical juncture after six months of relentless conflict, with no tangible signs of progress in the US-supported negotiations spearheaded by Qatar and Egypt aimed at brokering a hostage deal. You are our friends, but you are also diplomats. You hold the power to change. <clears throat> and I would like you to demand from your government, from my government, from the Qatari government, to change this narrative. And you now are at a place where you can be a part of a better future for this region. The time to act is now. After Hamas recently rejected yet another proposal, they demanded that any new agreement must bring an immediate end to the ongoing hostilities in Gaza, including the complete withdrawal of Israeli forces from the region, adding yet another layer of complexity to an already fraught negotiation process. Yad Ezrav Shulamit is an incredible organization dedicated to providing much-needed food arrangements to displaced families and newly orphaned children. In the aftermath of the October 7th attack, the need has become greater than ever. Passover is approaching, and Yad Ezrav Shulamit is really close to reaching their goal, as this unique organization is determined to reach everyone they possibly can. Thanks to Yad Ezrav Shulamit, the most vulnerable sectors in today's society will be taken care of, but they need your help. If you'd like to join this campaign, please scan the QR code on your screen. 62,000 food baskets and vouchers have been requested for Passover. That means fruits and vegetables, chickens, boxes of matzah, oil, canned goods, and food vouchers. With your help, young orphans won't go hungry. Their only hope is you. They turn to us, we turn to you. Help us feed over 300,000 people for Passover. Looking ahead, what will happen in the North? The Israeli government has instructed all citizens to prepare for an all-out war. Our 14 trucks will be able to deliver food to anyone in bomb shelters across the country. Let's make sure everyone has food to survive this crisis. Please, open your hearts to your brothers and sisters in Israel. Facing this looming threat, yet Ezra Vishula Meat remains committed to feeding Israel, ensuring that no one is left behind during these very difficult times. Together with your support, we can continue to make a difference in the lives of those who need it most. We are all soldiers in this war against the Jewish people. Help us win this war. Joining me now to discuss the impact and importance of this initiative by Yad Ezrav Shulamit is celebrity chef and best-selling kosher cookbook author, Jamie Geller. Jamie, thank you for joining us again. Thank you so much for having me. I love being on ILTV. Thank you. Since the last time you were on the show, we stressed to our viewers the need this year to feed Israel's new poor. We've learned that donations have been coming in. What can you tell us from your end? So that's why I'm so happy to be here. It's been unbelievable and so heartwarming to see how the ILTV viewers have opened their hearts and opened their wallets to feed over 300,000 needy, hungry, vulnerable citizens of Israel. We're talking about widows and orphans, children, entire families that have been displaced because of the war or also whose breadwinners are out literally fighting now on the front lines. So it's been unbelievable and we've almost reached our goal, but we still need to, we still need 4,000 food baskets and we need ILTV viewers to help us. We're almost at Passover and we're so close to the goal. If any of our viewers would like to join this initiative now, how could they help? 
So first of all, there's going to be a little QR code or a link right here. So you can go. Last time I asked people to please sponsor one food basket. Of course, anything helps. But I'm going to ask people, please sponsor two. We are so close to making our goal. Please donate whatever you were going to give. Give a little bit more. This is the Passover holiday. We mentioned before, it is the most celebrated holiday for Jewish people around the world. And I don't know if you can hear behind me, but my house is joyous right now. There's music on. We're cooking in the kitchen. I just made about 15 pounds of brisket, 20 quarts of chicken soup. I'm hosting a lot. And there are people who don't even know if they will be able to put food on the table for this holiday. And like I said, the most vulnerable populations, children, orphans, widows, new orphans and new widows because of the war, elderly Holocaust survivors, and God willing, we will not have to spend our holiday in a bomb shelter, but just imagine these people in a bomb shelter. We need to prepare them and stock their pantries. If God forbid that's the case, but God willing, that will not be. Certainly a mitzvah. And Jamie, finally, if you had a message to our viewers now, what would it be? I just think this is the time that we celebrate our freedom. It is such a beautiful holiday. It is such a luxurious holiday. As I mentioned, my table will be filled with guests, but there are those who are alone. They have just lost their fathers. They have just lost their husbands, or they've been displaced from their families, uh, excuse me, displaced from their homes because of the war. The industry has shut down, and they're not looking forward to this holiday with the joy that we all are. They're nervous about what they're even going to eat. They're nervous for their safety and for their security. So for those of us who are able to, for those of us who are excited to greet our family around the table and to cook and to serve and to enjoy, we need to open our hearts and our wallets and give give even more than you think that you were planning to. Please, like I said, we're just so close. 4,000 more food baskets. And I know that we can do this together with God's help. And this is the best viewership ever. We're so, we love, love, love how it's you've shown up for the Jewish people, for Israel and for the and for the needy, and we know that we can do it here together. Jamie Geller, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today about these important initiatives. An Israeli artist has locked her exhibit in the Venice Biennale as she called for the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages. ILTV's William Sharon with more. Israeli artist Ruth Patir says she'll only open her exhibit, Motherland, once an agreement has been reached to bring the hostages home and end the war in Gaza. The Venice Binalia, a highly acclaimed art gallery, has been receiving immense backlash and protests from pro-Palestinians since February to ban the Israeli artists from this year's 60th International Art Exhibition. Patir, Israel's representative this year, turned the tables when she announced in the New York Times interview that her exhibition will be locked ahead of the first preview day of the event on April 20th. Israeli artist Patir, with her creators, Mira Lapidod and Tamal Margalit said in a statement that they choose not to cancel the exhibition. Instead, they look to stand in solidarity with the families of the hostages and the Israeli community, calling for a chance, further stressing the plea of the hostages. There was no immediate comment from the biennial organizers. And let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around the country tonight with lows of around 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we'll see more clear skies seeing highs of about 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the State of Israel. I'm Sivan Raviv. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.